to another edition of Action 14. I'm Mike Briggs, bringing you information regarding the city, the schools, and the community and arts. I have with me uh, Superintendent of Schools, Dan Mallow. Thanks for coming. Hi, Mike. Glad uh, to be here. We were not able to have you on last month, so we're going to actually stretch that out just a little bit to cover some various items that you had at several meetings. This is a busy time of year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like always a, it's always a busy time of year, but uh, as this time of year, you're gearing up for your plans already actually for next year right. and things like summer school and all of those types of things. And, and a lot of work gets done in summer, both by teachers and by our uh, custodial maintenance group. And if there's any kind of major repair that needs to get done to building, that all has to get done in summer. So it does make it a busy time of year. Yeah, let's talk summer school just briefly because summer school is going to be mainly at Riverview. Right. It's a, a bit of a change for people. Um, one of the reasons is because we're replacing the HVAC system, so the air exchanging in the pool that's at the high school is the original. So yeah. those fans and blowers and motors and everything else that are well making over that 50 work. 50 years old. About 50 years old, and as you know, chlorine is a harsh uh, chemical with metals, and so it definitely is being held toge together with bubble gum and, uh, and duct tape. So that's being replaced over the course of summer. So the pool is uh, basically, it, it, there's going to be some disruptions to service in the pool. So it gave us the opportunity to do something that I think we're going to plan to do moving into the future, which is move the main uh, location of summer school to different schools. Uh, like it might be here and Horizon one year, but it might be Riverview and Fairview another year. And the reason for that is because when summer school is always in the same location, the deep cleaning, you know, like the stripping of wax off of tile floors and putting new multiple coats of wax on and really getting into every nook and cranny doesn't happen as well in the building where the summer school is. And so traditionally it's always been mm -hmm. at the high school. And if we can move it around a little bit, then the high school can get a good, decent, deep clean. And likewise, uh, Horizon is, is where our younger kids generally went to their summer school. And so they also would get a chance to get uh, a deep clean if we have more of a rotation like this. Right. Uh, the only caveat is the pool and swimming lessons for kids is a big deal uh, with our summer school program. And so we'd have to figure that out and maybe if it's in different locations, we have a quick transport back and forth, uh, highlight areas like our uh, food science and ag center, uh, which can get used in summer, which is a great place. Kids love to get hands on and dirty and grow things. Um, we can maybe do some transportation uh, between uh, let's say Riverview and the high school at the mm -hmm. beginning or at the end of a day and still make it work. So that's our intent. And, okay. um, but that's this year, yes, it's at Riverview and mm -hmm. uh, there will be some of the, like the, the little 4Kers and kindergartners and some of the really young ones, there will be some opportunity at uh, Horizon as well. Let's talk briefly about things that happened last month. You had a lawyer in, you had some discussion all about Title IX and maybe our community needs to know what Title IX stands for, what, what it really is. Right. Title IX is an equity provision, uh, and uh, it, what it, it, it's, uh, it's a legal document, it's, it's a legal binding uh, document for uh, public entities. Mm -hmm. So it applies to schools and governmental agencies and uh, town halls and, and those types of things. And it really just says that you need to be equitable. Mm -hmm. in many, many, many different ways. Um, and, you know, so it gets into things like sports. Um, you know, how many teams uh, and opportunities do you have for girls versus boys? But it also gets into uh, other protected classes. Uh, and, and it only applies to protected classes. So uh, protect, protected classes are groups that, uh, you know, ethnic minorities or um, uh, people with the disabilities of certain mm -hmm. specific types of disabilities, even socioeconomic uh, standing in some cases. Um, but the hot button issue in, yeah. in this meeting uh, relates to uh, 
transgender students. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Title IX, as it's currently interpreted by uh, the Supreme Court and by other legislation, uh, indicates that uh, there are specific ways that we are, uh, that we have to treat as a community and as a, as a, uh, a public entity, uh, all students and specifically uh, uh, students that identify uh, as transgender. Right. And so uh, there, it, it does cause it, um, some people to become, you know, upset or they don't understand it and, it, it, yep. you know, it, it doesn't make traditional sense uh, because what happens is facilities uh, are able to be accessed. So things like bathrooms and locker rooms right. are able to be accessed by students who identify as a gender w that they weren't assigned at birth. And you had, you had quite a crowd here uh, for this meeting and they had some excellent questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say that uh, the lawyer you had had excellent answers. Yeah, right, and I mean, he's done this multiple times before because when these issues arise, it, it typically, the, the questions that arise and the concerns that arise are pretty much usually the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's been through this before. I thought he did a really nice job of going through the, the history of, of uh, you know, where Title IX came from, um, a, a bit of a history of some of the big Supreme Court cases over the last hundred years that have dealt with protected classes. So going all the way back to the civil rights movement and, mm -hmm. and all of that and where all this stems from right. to, to lay the foundation for the discussion. And then of course getting into the nitty gritty, which is, you know, if a, a student that wants to access a restroom that is a restroom that isn't the one that, uh, uh, coincides with their gender at, that was assigned at birth, how do you go about that? What, right. what, what communication can you, uh, uh, what, what types of communication can you have? What kind of discussions can you have with that student, with the other students? And there, there are a lot of restrictions. Right. I think that was interesting for the group to hear that you, know, you just can't tell people that this is happening in a location, in a building. You can't do that because it's too identifiable. And you're actually setting the district up for a lawsuit if you do that. Right. So you're, you're kind of giving yourself some legal liability there. And so some of those questions are people, you know, add were, you know, are, if this happens, then what? Well, what mm -hmm. if we did this? And I think the lawyer did a good job of yep. saying, well, you know, this is, we're not saying right or wrong, don't shoot the messenger. This is the way it is. This is the way the Supreme Courts have ruled on it over time. And uh, yes, they do have access to use these areas. If you're uncomfortable, uh, please talk to the principal uh, of the building or an uh, authority so that you can maybe find a, a, a better situation for yourself. Um, and so there just has to be a lot of communication, but a individual communication well. between a student and a principal, for example, or a different student uh, and, and uh, a counselor. Mm -hmm. But it can't be these general communications specifically about a person. So right. it was very interesting and, um, and I think people left maybe not agreeing that this is the right way. Um, I think some people probably left feeling that way. But at least understanding that this is currently in the statutorily and uh, constitutionally, mm -hmm. uh, it, Title IX talks about the rights of a person, and this is uh, the way it's being yep. uh, interpreted right now in the courts. Yeah. It was a very <coughs> interesting night for, for myself to see a lawyer speak to every question, answer it thoroughly, and I think everybody walked away on more understanding, they may not agree, but at least they understand why it has to be this way. Yeah. Right, right, I, and that was the hope. Um, but I think there still is a lot more, these major changes to what people have experienced through their yeah. lives are, if it flips it on, it flips you, something on its head for you, it takes a while to, under, to, yep. to come around to seeing yep. things differently. Yep. I know that uh, the other item coming up was budget. At that time of year, you've been working on budget, but now it's time to 
finalize a few things and say, where are we going? What's how we're already making decisions on how we're going to spend budget next fiscal year because the fiscal year of schools starts July 1st. Right. That's an interesting thing for the community, for the public to know. Most places are January 1 to January 1. Well, schools are July 1 to July 1. Right. And so our uh, things like insurance bids and things mm -hmm. like that don't coincide with the school district budget calendar. So um, it's just interesting. And schools are, our budgets are about 80% personnel. Mm -hmm. Go to any school district, they're all just about the same. Yeah, we have buildings and electric, electricity and all the rest of it, but most of the expenditures that uh, make up a di school district's budget are people. Right. The people that work there. And so um, at this time of year, we are making projections about how many people we're going to have, who they are, what level of salary they're at. And this year what's really interesting is that um, because uh, there are inflationary pressures in the job market, the job market is tight, the economy is doing so well and it's booming so incredibly well that they're anybody who wants to work is can work and they can shop between different places to right. get a higher salary and they can negotiate now because there are fewer people. The same is true of teachers and the same is true of pretty much every position that we have here, custodial maintenance, um, uh, uh, you know, administrative assistant, mm -hmm. uh, technology. Right. People, if you want to go and try to negotiate a higher wage somewhere, somebody's probably going to be willing to pay you because they can't find the people. Right. And there's such a shortage right now for teachers. I think we should, mm -hmm. we should mention that, the fact that uh, there are less st students going into the field of education Correct. than ever before. And so this, this shortage of staff is going to continue for many years. Right. If you look at any teacher preparation program at colleges, or, you know, uh, we work with UWGB quite closely, but other colleges as well, they're all at 40% of what they were or, or less uh, just a few short years ago. Like right. in, in 2010, uh, they had a lot more people uh, mm -hmm. and then you know, lots of things changed. Um, and so, yeah, those shortages create... Um, advantages for workers in that they can they can find lots of places to work uh, but and also they can negotiate wages mm -hmm. but it increases the pressure to you know keep up with the Joneses right and so those pressures are most school districts are increasing their salaries just so that they can hire people and and, and hang on to them. and hang on to them and right. retain them yeah. right uh, because it's uh, clearly defined in, in a lot of educational research that, yeah, you can bring in new teachers and they might be really great, but transitions mm -hmm. uh, in schools when you have a lot of turnover is detrimental to student achievement. Right. So you want to have, as you, you try to have less turnover than more because every time you have some turnover, it kind of slows down the growth. Right. If you can maintain a good quality teacher for 20, 30 years, that's really important. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're building the budget on, on projections that everybody else is, you know, increasing their salaries too. And at the same time, the state legislature has seen clear to, uh, again, I mentioned this, I think, last time I was in here, uh, put zero money right. uh, into education this past year. They're, they're claiming to put the money in, but it really is just a sleight of hand because it's money that has to go back to taxpayers. We are spending the exact same amount on a student next year that we were allotted and allowed to spend uh, two years ago. Right. So if this continues into the future and everybody needs to have, you know, is competing with each other for quality employees, uh, we're creating a, a structural deficit mm -hmm. that at the end of this uh, COVID funding time, uh, when we're using these ESSER dollars to fill in what we're missing from our state legislature. Um, if there's no new money put in, there are going to be some hard decisions that have to be made. Right. And um, that's everywhere in the state, not, mm -hmm. not just here, uh, which means 
cuts to things. And so we don't want that to happen. We keep advocating with our legislators to mm -hmm. at least put a little in so that that cliff isn't as defined at the end of 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and it, sometimes these things take, a, the, the wheels of yep. government sometimes move a little ungreased. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we should talk about uh, updates. You already said that we're going to be working on the pool this summer, but we have several different items where uh, facilities in general that have to be updated. Right. Every year we do this and we yep. set what's the most important, what should we do now, and uh, there are many items that are going to be happening this summer. Right. We have an ongoing operations and maintenance plan that we update with our board uh, uh, facilities committee uh, every year, and so we try, there are usually some bigger ticket items, things like roofs or things like boilers or HVAC systems that, you know, need repair and they're not cheap. And so we try to do something, a few things that are larger every summer mm -hmm. and try to you know, manage our money as best we can so we're able to, to do those. Uh, so this year we are uh, replacing, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, HVAC system in the pool. Right. So the air will be much better in the Let's pool. Let's hope so. And then uh, we're also, uh, I think I mentioned the last time, we're replacing the track surface at the high school. That's been on several years since the track was put in and uh, it needs to be resurfaced. Correct. So that the underlying asphalt of the track will remain. There's a couple of parts that need to be cut out and replaced. But what that means, there's a rubberized surface that's on the top of the track and so that needs to be replaced. And we're also fixing the drainage at the high school, at, at Finky Field, at the, at the high yeah. school. And there are, it, it's all clay. It is. And, and there, are, there are some springs. If anybody ever drives up Highland Avenue for going past Horizon, you'll see one of the springs because it continually right, washes out the road. <laughs> yeah. Year after year, they keep on working on it and patching it. But, it, you know, in, in winter and spring, it, it, it weeps. Mm -hmm. We have a weeping wall. Yeah, uh, but so that same spring system is by the, is is at the field, and so we're doing some work to uh, hopefully fix some of those drainage issues with drain tile and things. And that opens the door for something. Correct. And so, seeing as we were going to be spending the money on the track and and digging into the field and trying to fix the drainage and that soil issue at the field anyway, we thought. Uh, and other people from the community mentioned, uh, maybe this would be the time to uh, put in uh, artificial turf at the high school field because it allows you to always play on it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to keep the band off of it. You don't have to keep youth sports off of it. You can actually play more than one sport. Mm -hmm. You can play football and soccer on it. Uh, and you're not worried about tearing it up on a rainy night uh, in practice sometime, you, mm -hmm. you actually use the field because it's always available. And it's also available earlier and later right. in a season. Right. You can host a soccer sectional if you have an artificial turf surface or uh, a football sectional if you have an artificial sur surface. So there's lots of benefits to it. And so we said, well, let's find out if we can. We can't afford it, but if we can fundraise for it, the turf itself, uh, in a typical uh, turf situation, and maybe some of the soil underneath, is somewhere around anywhere between six hundred to eight hundred thousand to do some of that work. And seeing as we were already working on the soil and the, and the drainage, we thought, let's see if we can fundraise for the turf itself. And we went out to some companies, and we'll have some announcements coming in a, in a mm -hmm. little while. But uh, we have some local companies that are uh, uh, helping to fund the turf. And uh, that will be, some of them are doing incrementally over five years. But the turf itself will be paid for 100% by donations, uh, sponsorships from our community partners. Not a single tax dollar will be used for this turf. That's what we need everybody to understand. Correct. It's all going to be from our local businesses and a couple individuals as well are mm -hmm. putting in some money into it. But, yeah, it's not tax, taxpayer funded. But it certainly will be a benefit to our citizens mm -hmm. because we do a lot of community events uh, on the field. I, I, I know we've done some uh, Veterans Day uh, activities sure. out there. They'd, Conrad would like to maybe consider that again in the future. Um, and also, um, or maybe it was Memorial Day. It was, it was Memorial Day. It was Memorial Day. I was wrong. I misspoke. Um, but uh, 
and we have, there's youth activities. We have youth soccer, youth football that mm -hmm. could use the field and use it under the lights and those yep. types of things. So it's a, it's a benefit to all citizens. And it just talks about the generosity all, and, uh, and the partnerships that we have with our local yeah. businesses as it well. Is, because it is nice. It, it, yep. It's wonderful that they're there for us. Uh, let's do just a bit of talk about United Way before we wrap up because United Way is important and we use PATH as our United Way uh, code, if you will. Sure. Well, United Way, uh, we, every year we have a, fu uh, a, a fundraising drive and mm -hmm. it's kicking off for our school district employees right now. And so we go around we, when we talk about the benefits that just the district and the students of the district receive from United Way, and it's in a number of ways. One of the ways is uh, with our infants and, mm -hmm. and little kids. We have uh, Parents as Teachers is a program that the United Way helps fund. There are some screenings that are done for kids coming into 4K and, right. and 5K that the United Way helps with and, and um, reaches out to families. Uh, and that's a wonderful program. It helps parents know what to do and how to, mm -hmm. you know, get books out and show them things and, and just helps kids get more ready mm -hmm. for school. So that's one thing that the United Way does and that, that's kind of in partnership with the school district. Another one is the PATH program, which is uh, providing access to mental health services or getting people that need mental health services a direction or a Mm -hmm. a path to find it right. and actually making those connections for students and families. And, and because of what we've had over the last two years with COVID and, and being housing the way it has been where you had to stay in, inside too much, it, it, we do need some assistance. We absolutely do. And it's a national, it's, it's a global yes, it is. Phenomenal right, phenomenon right now. Uh, there just are more people that need more help uh, with the, in, in areas of mental health. Mm -hmm. Anxiety seems to be higher than ever. Uh, right. So those types of things. And when it gets out of control, students aren't able to function and learn. Right. And so we can get them, if we can get them back on track through some of these earlier interventions and right at school, and the key thing is, because it's through the United Way, it's at no cost to the families. Right. If they can't afford it, they still get the services, and that's the wonderful thing. And so um, we go out to our teaching staff, and I would just advocate to anybody who would like to donate to the United Way, all of the United Way dollars that are received in this community can be earmarked by you, the donator, to stay Steve. in specific th things, even specific programs in this community. And the community board that runs the United Way has annual applications for all of those uh, uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. So they know they're held accountable. It's not like this money just goes flittering away some way. It actually helps here. So that's, what we're, that's why we're uh, happy to partner with them. Yep. Um, I just want to talk just a bit about how things uh, are getting back to a, a sense of normal. Because uh, last night, we've had kind of a rough spring to get in. Softball, Oof. baseball, track, soccer, it's, it's tennis. It's, uh, it's been a tough spring because we've had snow about three or four every other morning for a while. Mm -hmm. But yesterday was a beautiful day, and every field was being used. We had a home girls softball game. We had a home boys baseball game. We had a home soccer game. And we had a home track meet. Everybody it was, was beautiful yep. out. It was fantastic to be up and look at the top of the bleachers and look out at all those different areas. We're getting back to something happening. Yeah, it was, it was great to see. And I, I, I just happened to be up in the, the press box at Finky Field because I run, it's something I've always done, I you run the timing the system yeah. and do the automatic scoring for the, tra yeah, for the yeah. timing for track. But from that vantage point, you could, I, we, I could watch the JV soccer down here at the, fo at the practice field. I could watch the varsity soccer and softball over here. I could see the baseball team up yeah. over here. Everybody was in action. It was really cool. Yeah, it is so nice when you see all of our students participating and all of our facilities being used to its fullest. Right. It, it's wonderful to see. Yeah. Yep. Well, I certainly want to thank you for being on. Thank you I want to thank for having every, me. I want to thank everyone for stay, hanging in there because we've got a a quarter to go, less than a quarter to go, and everything looks good. 
It absolutely does. Yes. I want to thank you. I want to tell everybody that the school board meetings are the third Tuesday of every month right here in the Plymouth Amphitheater starting at 530. And you are welcome to come up and find out what's happening in the school district. Thank right. you again. Thank you for having me. When we come back, I've got the mayor in the house, and we're going to talk about a few things and maybe enlighten you to some ideas that you may not have known about. So stay right with us. You're watching Action 14. Welcome back to Action 14. As promised, I've got the mayor in the hot seat. We're going to be talking about what's happening in and around the city of Plymouth. It's been a kind of a tough spring for us there. Mayor, uh, every other morning for a while, I've had a little snow on the ground, but it looks like we finally can see the light coming. I see everything sprouting, and uh, uh, we're, we're, we're done with winter. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> yeah, we do have some, some inches of snow north and west of here, oh, but, but, and, but and not as long coming as, in. As long as it stays north of us, we can tell our TV14 viewers that we're looking out for their warm weather interests. Yes, <laughs> but it's been a tough spring, but uh, not enough snow to really call out the... Any, any of the shoveling and anything. Yeah, uh, at, at this point, I am willing to say publicly that I have put my snowblower away and I have the shovel and the broom handy but don't want to use either there one. There you go. Well, let's talk about the fact that um, spring is in the air and uh, we've got some great weather, but uh, we have to plan for, for many things yet. Well, and, and springtime is always a, a joyous time of the year. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to get out. They've been, you know, cooped in all winter yeah. and, and they're just chomping at the bits. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that concerns us on the city side of things and in the school and everybody as well. But, you know, we're responsible for public safety. Mm -hmm. and. Sometimes you can say it all you want and it, it, you try to avoid something happening that's going to be so significant that to fix it is cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So we, we like to take action ahead of time and try to use some prevention approaches to it and we already put our, because of the weather, we put our cones out where crossings are mm -hmm. normally used by, by residents. And it's important to remind people that pedestrians have the right of way. Mm -hmm. Whether people know that or not, whether drivers know that or not, it's important that, you know, they become familiar with it. And we are looking at the cost, and it's not cheap, of putting overhead, and some cities have them when you travel around, the yellow flashing warning, warning pedestrian crossings to put in, well, I can think of probably 10 or 12 locations. The courts have said, well, did you give them enough warning? Did you do this? Did you do that? Well, when you've got a bright blinking yellow light overhead with a big sign on it, there's nobody that's going to say you didn't know you were supposed to slow down. And it, it's expensive. And I, I guess the, the warning to drivers is to slow down, uh, look for, you know, any unexpected uh, crossing, and if you choose not to stop for pedestrians and we give you a ticket, I want to thank you ahead for helping to pay for those signs. There you go. And <laughs> it's not going to be cheap no. uh, because they're very expensive. And it's gotten more difficult, too, because now parking restrictions have been lifted, and so there's more cars parked at the curb throughout the city. Oh, and so yes. when you come up to a stop sign, you look both ways, but there are so many cars at the curb that it's very difficult to see other cars approaching. It, it is, and, and that's a very good comment because 
the cars weren't there a week or two weeks ago. Right. And the kids weren't there a week or two weeks ago. And now you've got joggers out and you have just people out walking and enjoying the weather. And on top of it, we keep trying to cut back the hedges on corners because you can't see over the new growth, mm -hmm. which is going to happen very quickly now yeah. as things start budding. So safety first is the absolute best way to go. And please, don't help us pay for these with tickets. <laughs> That's we'll right. find another method to pay That's for just, them. Just obey the law, and when you come up to an area where there's a crossing, slow down and look both ways oh, to see if anyone is absolutely. coming. Because uh, as of today, I, I stopped for a jogger, and they're moving quite quickly into that dangerous area, if you will. Yeah, and... More and more joggers are wearing clothing that is easy to see. Uh, the worst thing is a person wearing a black sweatshirt and black pants. <laughs> Not a good thing to reflect off of or, right. or pick up with your eyesight. So uh, we encourage certainly caution on, on the, the jogger and the pedestrian side, but we need to slow down in the city and be aware, because springtime is a very, very uh, tough time for all of us, and, mm -hmm. and safety first, please. Right, right. Um, I got kind of a kick out of the fact that we have five seasons. Yes, and the fifth season is? Construction season. Construction season, season. <laughs> and so we've just opened the door. It's construction time. It's, and we already started. Yep. Uh, we've unloaded equipment. We're starting to you know, work on trenches and that changes the traffic patterns. And today, I don't want to badmouth anybody in particular, but an 18-wheeler was going down a street that did not say truck route. Mm -hmm. I understand why they do that sometimes, but it's not what they're supposed to do. And that makes it worse because now you're interrupting traffic with a big 53-foot rig that eventually, in this case, I'm sure he wanted to do a left-hand turn, mm -hmm. and the way he was going, that is not an easy turn. So drivers sometimes don't take the right route. We as citizens need to uh, be careful, and all around, it's, it's just get used to the new patterns that we're faced with. Now we have a master plan, and you actually had a meeting last month to talk over a master plan for downtown. Right, we, we have a design committee mm -hmm. that is taking the downtown designated area, and they've been at it now for 18 months, and you're right, we met last week with proposals for uh, building uh, remodeling and different things. We're also in a historic district now, mm -hmm. so we have certain specifications that we have to uh, abide by with that designation, which is federal and state, and there are historic credits to the homeowners, building owners of those structures, but it is something that uh, we're trying to encourage the participation in. Everybody is grandfathered that's mm -hmm. there today. It's those that follow us that we're trying to not have something that doesn't fit into what we're trying to create downtown. And the master plan that we're now hopefully finishing this year, by law we have to do it every 10 years. So we look back 10 years at how well, we predicted mm -hmm. the first 10, and now we're looking 10 beyond that, so we're going to see how accurate we did it in the past and where some of the changes maybe in, for instance, residential housing direction shifted mm -hmm. or manufacturing or business. And we have seen some significant shifts over the last 10 years. So this is required by state law, and we'll have another public hearing on that. Mm -hmm. We're going to have one in May. We're going to have another one in June, and we want people to participate in that, be familiar with 
the process that we're going through. And if you see something we don't see, by all means, remind us, tell us, mm -hmm. because we don't think of everything. We contracted with outside companies that do this sort of thing, but they're only as good as the information that we give them and, and ideas that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to bring up an idea that I just may have heard about that tells me that um, maybe we have another person possibly retiring in the city I, at the top mark. <laughs> I, I always like it, Mike, you have excellent sources. I still have to find out who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> But that's good. I, I, I'm not complaining by no means. Uh, you're right. Uh, we have Chief Tauschek, mm -hmm. who has been chief uh, of the police department now for 16 years, and he has over 40 years in the department, mm -hmm. will be uh, retiring officially on May 5th. Yep. And that leaves a big gap in the department that uh, he has been part of, I think, everything from school liaison yeah. to crosswalk supervisor to investigations to mm -hmm. night patrol. I mean, you name it. Uh, matter of fact, he was the last one who rode our Harley Davidson motorcycle, mm -hmm. which we have now disposed of. But uh, yeah, so he, he did it all. And he served the city uh, with great, great pride and integrity. Right. Uh, it's going to leave a big gap in our experience. And for the first time, uh, Don Davis was chief before uh, Chief Tauschek. Uh, it'll be about oh, 30 years before uh, we've had outside looking mm -hmm. for uh, a new chief to come in and uh, the police and fire commission is putting together a job description, salary range, mm -hmm. job requirements, which are significantly different than they were 30 years that's ago. That's true. And I think that that's true in every job qualification because standards have kept moving up the ability and professionalism has kept improving. And of course, that's what we're looking for in, in a uh, department head. But he'll be taking over a uh, well-tuned department that's running pretty smoothly. And at the same time, it presents challenges uh, within the department and new standards that are coming down and how do we implement those and how do we balance uh, law enforcement with public safety? Yeah, and it's not only that, but now you've got a lot of changes coming with a, a new city administrator possibly on the horizon and now a new police chief. So there's going to be some uh, big changes happening in the city. Well, and that takes a lot of coordination on the side of the city administrator. We have narrowed it down to 11 candidates. Those 11 will go through the next process of review with, again, our outside consultant. We're hoping by the end of May that we will have it down to five, six candidates for the city council to do interviews on okay. and see how they look at a community our size. I think the good news is the word out there is that we are uh, a very modern community, a very welcoming community, a community that has good jobs, good education, and high living standards. So that person, he or she will, I feel, be able to step in and really uh, take the ball and run with it, just like a new police chief will have a good start and then how to go forward and put their individual mm -hmm. touch on it and how they see things going. 
Um, on another, just on another note briefly uh, before we end this is that we have some doctor offices coming? Yes, uh, we do. We've got uh, the old, I think the best way to say it is the uh, old Rexall Pharmacy yep. out, out in the uh, Kmart area next to Pick and Save and, and the Neat Repeats. They're looking at locating in that facility, and the word is is that Neat Repeats will slide around the corner and occupy the uh, part of uh, the Kmart facility. Okay. We don't have any, that's private negotiations mm -hmm. and discussions, but uh, there's a sizable uh, office doctor complex that will be coming in. And there again, that's private. There's no city funding or, or loans going out for okay. that. And uh, we certainly look at that bringing in additional services to the community, mm -hmm. which is important to have those services local. Okay. Well, I certainly want to thank you for uh, being on. And uh, when we come back next month, we'll have some more information about things that are changing in Plymouth. I would tend to think so. Thank you and thank you to your viewers. If you want to be part of what's happening in the city, understand that the city council has meetings on the first, let's take it, the second and last. Second and last. Second and last uh, Tuesday of every month down at City Hall starting at? 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. Be part of what's happening and understand how the city runs. Thank you again. You're welcome. Always a pleasure, Mike. When we come back, I may have Donna. I'm looking for Donna Hahn in the, in the audience. We'll see if she's going to be able to be on. So stay right with us. You're watching Action 14.